When it comes to innovation in the roller coaster space, what metric do you use to identify progress? Is it how smooth roller coasters get over time? What new crazy elements that manufacturers can develop? New advancements in technology that change the way we present roller coasters? These are all notable factors that display how the roller coaster industry continues to move forward. But to the general public, there's only one statistic that actually conveys progress. That being, how tall can we build roller coasters? Height is the most recognizable thing about a roller coaster. It's the reason why most people are scared of roller coasters. Coasters. And on some level, I can understand, it's intimidating to see an imposing structure that's beyond your scope with a first drop that can possibly be beyond vertical that has a sole purpose of invoking fear and butterflies. But butterflies are adorable and I like them. Roller coasters themselves, they can only get so tall. And it's amazing when a park can actually break the height record because it truly is an impressive feat in engineering. It's challenging to construct a ride to a certain stature. Who here remembers the Coaster Wars? Where literally every park across the globe, they were constantly trying to one-up one another. Everybody was trying to build the world's tallest coaster. And it all started with Cedar Point back in 1989 when they debuted Magnum XL200, the first ever coaster to break the 200 foot barrier. And then almost immediately after Magnum, the height record, it began to bounce around a bit. Suddenly, Kennywood had the record, then Blackpool Pleasure Beach, then Fujiku Highland in Japan. Then once the year 2000 rolled around Cedar Point, they broke the 300 foot barrier with Millennium Force. Then three years later, they built the world's first strata coaster, the first roller coaster to break the 400 foot barrier. Just ignore this ride though, apparently it doesn't count. It wasn't until 2005 when the record for the world's tallest coaster came to a standstill with King to Cod's Six Flags Great Adventure. This strata coaster capped out at a height of 456 feet and for the longest time this was it. The height record was never broken again. King Ka was the world's tallest coaster, and it remained that way for 20 years. No park would dare challenge the height record until one day some oil was dug up in Saudi Arabia, and the monarchy said, I want more tourists. Let's build a roller coaster. And that's how Falcon's Flight came into the world. A roller coaster that breaks every record as it stands at a height of 640 feet along the side of a cliff. Not only did Six Flags Cadilla decimate the 500 foot mark, but they blew right past it and went straight for 600. This ride is insane, and I honestly don't know how much taller roller coasters can get after Falcon's Flight. One day, are we gonna have a roller coaster that's 700 feet, 800 feet? Will we have a roller coaster that's as tall as the Willis Tower in Chicago? 1400 feet of pure adrenaline, I wanna see that. After all, 640 feet, that's not the end-all, be-all. Roller coasters can theoretically top that height. However, it's not likely to happen in our lifetime. Despite height being one of the most easy ways to market a roller coaster, and being one of the most impressive statures of a roller coaster, there's just no incentive to build taller. There's not much of a reason to assemble another roller coaster over 600 feet. And a main reason for why is simply because it's impractical. There is a reason why a coaster like King Da Ka was able to hold onto its height record for so long before it got dethroned. There is a certain height where the record isn't worth it anymore, and once that height is reached, stay inflation for new worthy competitors will ensue. When a ride like King Nika opened, the height record became too elusive. So pretty much every park was done trying to break it. In fact, they were done with tall roller coasters altogether. Instead, shorter roller coasters were looked at more favorably. Coasters today would never go above 400 feet ever again. Occasionally, we did get a roller coaster over 300 feet every once in a while, but now it feels like roller coasters, they rarely go over 200 feet. It's leaving me scratching my head and asking, what's going on? Why do roller coasters today feel shorter than ever before, yet at the same time we're currently getting the tallest coaster ever? Well, there's a pretty simple and obvious answer that I've relayed many times before. Sorry that I sound like a broken record, but it all comes down to money. Roller coasters to this stature, they're expensive, but not for the reason that you expect. Coasters like King to Con and Top Thrill 2, they weren't expensive because they were tall. No. The height, yes, it does contribute to the overall cost, but the real money pincher is the speed. Speed is what's hindering taller roller coasters. Roller coasters as a concept, they're only trying to do one thing. Convert potential energy into kinetic energy. And how do most coasters achieve this? Well, you build a lift hill, 
You pull a roller coaster train to the top of it, and you release it. You gain potential energy when you go up the lift hill, and then you gain kinetic energy when you go down the lift hill. So if you have more potential energy, i.e. a taller roller coaster, then you're also going to have more kinetic energy, i.e. more speed or velocity. So if you build a taller roller coaster, it's naturally going to go faster. And if a roller coaster is faster, it might also have to be longer. Speed is just distance over time, so the faster you go, the more track you're going to use up. It's no coincidence that some of the tallest roller coasters are also the fastest roller coasters and are also the longest roller coasters. These rides have so much speed to burn off that if parks don't make these rides long enough, they're gonna be a short ride. Look at a coaster like Formula Rosa. That ride goes 149 miles per hour and spans almost 7,000 feet of track. Yet the ride experience itself, it's only a minute and 10 seconds from launch to brake run. A minute and 10 seconds to cover 7,000 feet. And the ride isn't even going 149 miles per hour for the entire duration. Immediately after Formula Rosa hits the end of the launch track, it is bombarded by brake fins to slow it down, dropping the ride's overall speed by nearly 50 miles per hour. Why does Formula Rosa do this? Well, controlling a roller coaster at this high of a velocity is difficult and it's costly. If Ferrari World wanted Formula Rosa to maintain its top speed after the first airtime hill, they would subsequently have to make the ride bigger and longer to account for its added velocity. It's way easier for Ferrari World to slow down the coaster after the first launch so they don't have to install more track. The already existing 7,000 feet is nothing to scoff at, but adding another 1 or 2,000 on top of it, that's at least another 5 to 10 million dollars. Then there's the Giga Coasters. All of those rides are between 5 to 7,000 feet, and they all have a max speed of 90 to 95 miles an hour. So even though these coasters, they have a lot of track, the ride experience concludes in roughly two minutes. At some point, all this additional track for these high velocity coasters isn't really worth it anymore. Why do you think a coaster like Top Thrill Dragster or King Nika utilizes a launch as opposed to a lift hill? I'm sure a 400 foot coaster with a lift hill, it could have been done, but if you get a ride to that altitude, you're likely going to get a top speed from 100 to 110 miles per hour, which just means you're going to need even more track, you're going to need more land, and you're going to need more money. Or instead of a lift hill, you can go for the launch approach. How about instead of a lift hill, you build one 400 foot tower and you install a launch to reach the apex. The only issue with this, however, is that the launch system, it's going to cost so much that it's going to obliterate the entire budget. So once again, the price of a tall roller coaster isn't about the height, it's about the speed. Coasters like Topville Dragster and King Nikah, they were not full package experiences. The parks, they both spent so much on the launch system for these rides that all they could have realistically done after the launch is go up and go down. Build one tall 400 foot tower that kind of looks like a giant Wang! Pay attention! I was distracted by that enormous flying pecker! Oh, where? Wait, that's not a woodpecker, it looks like someone's private! These coasters, they were a thrilling 17 seconds, but they were an expensive 17 seconds. And in the end, both rides, they didn't really work out. All I'm trying to say is that these tall, fast, long coasters aren't exactly worth it anymore. Especially when you can get the exact same experience or better experience on a smaller coaster. Roller coasters today that might seem puny and small can actually achieve the exact same forces as a ride like Falcon's Flight, all because of their track profiling and exceptional pacing. Companies like Intamin, Vacoma, Rocky Mountain Construction, they've mastered the art of manipulating forces on a roller coaster so they can match or exceed the forces on a different roller coaster of greater magnitude. Just because one coaster coaster might be larger than another coaster, that doesn't necessarily mean that the forces will amplify on that larger coaster. Let me give you an example to show you what I'm talking about. Let's say I have two roller coasters that are going at different speeds. One's going 156 miles an hour, and the other is going 70 miles an hour. I want both of them to go over an ejector airtime hill where the riders can experience a force of negative 1.5 Gs for a period of three seconds. Let me clarify, just because these coasters are going at different speeds doesn't mean they can't experience the same amount of force. All I have to do to make this negative 1.5 Gs equal on both tracks is manipulate the length of the track, the height of the airtime hill, and the curvature of the profile. I won't bore you with the math, I'll leave it on screen here here if you want to look. 
But essentially, for Roller Coaster A traveling at 156 miles an hour, it would need an airtime hill with a length of 672 feet and a hill height of 36 feet. With these parameters, the roller coaster can exert a force of negative 1.5 Gs for 3 seconds. If we look at roller coaster B going at 70 miles an hour, you may notice the airtime hill has the same height at 36 feet, but the length of the hill is only 272 feet. So you see, it doesn't really matter if a roller coaster is taller or faster. You can get the exact same amount of force on a smaller coaster if you alter the elements enough. This is why roller coasters aren't as tall anymore. It's because we don't need to make them tall. Why would a park spend a few extra million dollars on a roller coaster that's a little taller and a little faster when they objectively can get the exact same experience on a smaller ride? If both coasters had a lot of airtime and they each exerted an equivalent force, then why wouldn't you go with the cheaper alternative? Just go with the smaller attraction, you don't need to build tall. The only reason for why a park today would even choose to go high is because of marketing and vanity. After all, it's pretty easy to market a tall coaster. Their size and presence is what brings in the tourists. Like it or not, everybody judges a book by its cover. A coaster like Maverick might be better than a ride like Top Thrill 2, but Top Thrill 2 looks a lot more intimidating because of its height. But unfortunately, not every park can afford a Top Thrill 2, meaning that the best course of action for most parks is to just build short. Plus, if a ride like Falcon's Flight exists, then there's not much of a reason to even try anymore. No offense, but you can't compete with the oil money. So it's better if all the amusement parks out there, they focus on the mindset of building the best ride possible without worrying about the height. Will this mindset continue to lead to shorter attractions? Yeah, yeah it will. However, that doesn't necessarily mean we won't get diamonds in the rough. By the looks of it, we might actually see a few more giga coasters in the future. Maybe even another coaster over 400 feet. Will it be good though? Uh, that's to be determined. Either way, it looks like Falcon's Flight is going to hold onto the height record for quite a while. At least until another oil-rich country wants to try their hand.